Challenge runs are an incredible way to add spice and replayability to a game that you enjoy. The self-imposed restrictions present in these runs can allow creativity and drive you to use tools that the game offers that you'd never otherwise touch, and can be a lot of fun. Now, as a huge fan of games like The Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past, and Super Metroid, Another way that I've found to add a lot of spice to a game you love is by running that game through a randomizer. These sound like they'd be insane and result in impossible scenarios, but you gotta remember, the people that create these randomizer tools are much smarter than you and I, and build logic into their tools to make sure that there's always a path through the game. Not only do these randomizers make the game feel like new again, but they also often force you to do things outside of the normal order. YouTube seems to have made the executive decision that my channel should only succeed if I continue to post challenge runs. And I like getting views, and it seems like you all really enjoy these videos, so here I am again. But this time, I wanted to spice it up. What if I did my next challenge run in a randomizer? That sounds like fun, right? This was a mistake. So to start, we first gotta create the randomized world. Here's the settings I used. You can pause and read it all if you want, but the important parts are this. All great runes will be required to access the final boss. All flask items, story items, and upgrade bell bearings are randomized into key locations, which includes bosses, flask item locations, story item locations, talisman locations, and merchant shops. And the bias slider is set in a way that'll force me to explore almost the entire game. Fortunately, the randomizer includes an option to allow you to ignore all the mini dungeons like caves, catacombs, etc., which I'm grateful for since that could easily add another 30 to 40 hours to the run, and I think they're generally kind of boring anyway. And because I hate myself just enough, I also randomized all of the enemies, including bosses, for maximum chaos. I think that luck is going to decide how successful this run ends up being because I decided to shape this run around one of the worst and most useless spells in Elden Ring, Rock Blaster. Editor Clown here. Turns out I used the wrong spell name for this whole video. The spell's actual name is Shatter Earth. Rock Blaster is actually quite similar, but it's a completely different spell. Just remember that every time I say Rock Blaster or anything like it, I mean Shatter Earth. Okay, back to the video. This spell isn't useless because it's weak, because it actually does hit pretty hard. No, the real problem is that it's very, very slow and Elden Ring has no shortage of quick-moving bosses that won't hesitate to punish you at every opportunity. And since this spell is so slow, I will be allowing myself to use some of the other tools that fit in with the theme of a Stone Digger Miner, which I'll talk about as they come up. And because I think it'd be a little too easy to allow myself to use a melee weapon like a pickaxe, even though it's on theme, we'll consider this spell as my main weapon for this run. Anyway, let's stop procrastinating and get this run started. First things first, we gotta make a character. Each class's starting equipment is roughly randomized with the randomizer, but casters still start with a staff, and I'll need a fair bit of mind and intelligence if I hope to succeed, so I select the astrologer, and attempt to make the grungiest looking miner that I can think of. And this is where I make the first big mistake of this run, because there is one character I can think of who really cares about rocks a lot, and- No, they're minerals! Jesus! Okay, okay, jeez. They're actually just rocks, though? If this wasn't a randomized run, I'd know exactly where to go to get the spell I need, but because I have no way of knowing where it is without peeking into the spoiler log, and no guarantee that it's even possible for me to get at the start of the game, I use a little cheat engine magic here to equip the spell onto my character. Even though it requires 21 intelligence, I'm able to use it just fine. And with that, we can go ahead and see who this first boss is, and... Oh, it's the Soldier of Godric. Needless to say, I get absolutely memed on. Before venturing out into the world, I decided to test my spell on the Soldier's Replacement in his tutorial cave. Even though this is considered a mini-dungeon and won't give me anything important, I figured it would be a good place to learn how to use this spell in combat. Unfortunately, the boss down here is a scaly misbegotten who has some of the most delayed swinging animations in the game, which always trips me up. So it took more tries than I'd like to admit. We learn a few important things here though. First and worst is that this spell doesn't only take forever to hit, but it also takes ages to recover from, which is really scary when I have such a low health pull. 
Second is that this spell not only has its main explosion hitbox, but it also has a ticking hitbox for a moment before the explosion as the staff collides with the enemy's hurtbox. This secondary early hitbox deals low damage, but still enough that it adds up nicely over the course of a fight, and can be a nice consolation prize if the enemy ever moves away from the explosion. It's clear that I'm going to have to pick my windows of attack extremely carefully with this spell, and I'm already extremely worried about the viability of this run with the way that this fight is going. There are plenty of bosses that move extremely fast or have small punish windows, and I'm not sure if this spell is going to be up to the task. After about 10 minutes though, I finally latch onto this guy's patterns and take him down, and head out into the world for all of the start of the run flask chores. Even though I'm not guaranteed any flask upgrades from this trip, I still want to pick up everything that isn't nailed down, otherwise I could miss some valuable upgrades like talisman pouches, smithing stones, and more powerful staves for my spell. Staves? Staves? Make sure you comment how wrong I am below. And look, I could probably fill hours of this video going over every silly situation that this randomizer produces, you know, like this death bird killing itself because the AI doesn't understand how to navigate its new space, or this eldritch abomination spawn camping this grace on the way to the wondrous physic church, which still contains the wondrous physic flask, thank goodness. But I don't think you or I have that kind of time, so I'll keep this down to the important finds. As a part of this run, I end up doing all the usual checks like churches and lift ticket locations, but I also make a point of trying to visit every ruins basement that I can, and most importantly, visiting all the sarcophagus sites I can find. Normally they're filled with incredible edible runes, but this time there's a literal treasury filled with so many wonderful and fancy goodies most of which I can't use or don't care about. It's a nice place to find the occasional talisman though, as well as various smithing stones for upgrades and edible runes, so I don't have to worry about grinding levels the normal way. The edible runes are especially nice, as they're randomized pretty wildly such that I end up with plenty of high value runes pretty early. That allows me to pump up some levels and vigor so I'm not so squishy. Also, I make sure to visit all the merchants, you know, just in case. Unfortunately, Limgrave and Northern Kaled was mostly a bust. The smithing stones and runes were nice, and I even found a couple of golden seeds, but I wasn't able to find very many useful things at all. At least my staff is a bit stronger now, and I've gained a few levels, so let's see who replaced Margit. <laughs> oh, that's not good. It looks like Rykard found a new home. Fortunately, his lava doesn't seem to work here, so I can actually get in and get things done. But less fortunately, his hurt box is hot garbage. And even worse than that, even though bosses and enemies are scaled down to the area that they're appearing in, they're scaled proportionately to their stats. Rykard might lose a bunch of his attack power and his health, but he is the boss with the highest health pull in the game, so he's still a very tanky boy. While this may seem like a stroke of extraordinarily bad luck, this is actually pretty good. Rykard was one of my biggest worries coming into this rando, and even though we can't even dream of beating him yet, we can still out-level him, eventually. This arena is small and cramped, but this is pretty much the smallest amount of attack power and health he could possibly have. We can't kill him yet, but at least I won't have to worry about him showing up later with an inflated health pull. So I nope the hell out of that encounter and head to Liurnia for more item collection. With all this exploration, I'm really hoping to find some sacred tears, because this wimpy flask simply isn't cutting it even this early in the run, and I'm hoping even more to find the two halves of the lift ticket so I can go and explore the Altus Plateau. I'm also looking for the key to Hogwarts so I can see what fresh health that has to offer, but Liurnia as a whole was also kind of a wash. I know I'm gonna have to deal with Ronnie's questline later though, so I head up to Karia Manor to see who's blocking the way, and... Well, that's gonna be problematic, isn't it? By now I'm feeling a bit lost and desperate, so I go on a killing spree. First is this putrid Erd tree avatar in Northern Limgrave. It's funny how much easier these guys are than their non-putrid counterparts. They love to constantly spam their rot spray butt stomp attack, which gives me more than enough time to get a drill off on them. Pretty easy fight, and he even gave me a golden seed for my trouble. And the seller that normally houses the green dog talisman gave me the rusty key for the western side of Stormvale for, you know, when I can finally defeat Rykert. I also killed a couple of tibia mariners that had nothing useful, 
and went to kill Bernal so I don't have to buy any of his crap to spawn the Bell Bearing Hunter, which turned out to be a Dark Knight, and... and oh god, I forgot about these guys. They move around a ton, so it's extremely difficult to get a spell off on them. So I decided to leave him and come back a little later. One of the mariners was posted up outside of Kale's church, and I noticed I forgot to pick up this item in front of the church, which just so happened to be the Dragon Crest Shield Talisman plus two. That'll come in handy. Next, I head to Kaled to collect a bunch of junk and visit the merchants, and visit Redmain Castle, which all turned out to be a bust too. So I give Rykard another try, and <laughs> yeah, that's not happening. I'm running out of places to check. What's nice about this randomizer is that it gives Kale the ability to sell you location hints to show you where important items are located. But, unfortunately, that ability doesn't unlock until you reach Altus Plateau, so for now, at least, I'm on my own. There is another path to Altus, though, and I really, really didn't want to use it. But I guess at this point, what choice do I have left? So I make the climb, and I was pretty optimistic about my chances. There's a lot of bosses in this game, so I'm sure it won't be too bad, right? <laughs> right? Wrong. Hello, Placidusax. Another boss with a large health pool? Uh, great. Well, that's not happening, not yet at least. But at least this dragon's health pool isn't quite as imposing as Rikard's is. But even so, I'm still not properly equipped yet. By now, I'm a little over four hours into this run, and I feel like I haven't accomplished anything yet. I really underestimated just how resource-starved I'd be in a randomizer run, and just how bad of an idea combining the randomizer with this challenge would be. And then I remembered. There's a whole ass underground area that I haven't even touched yet. So I take my frustration out on a few hapless merchants so I can consolidate their bells, and without turning them in, I head down into Shifra River to see what I can find. The zone was mostly useless, but this merchant did have a few important items for me, so I buy what I need and murder him. Well, he murders me, but let's not argue semantics. It's not until I finish lighting all the flames that I realize that I completely forgot about an extremely important merchant in Elden Ring. The Twin Maiden Husks. Hello, beautiful. Finally, nearly six hours into the game, I find my first sacred tear. This life-giving nectar has never looked so sweet. And let's not forget about our good friend the Mimic tier. I didn't disallow spirit summons for this run, just in case. And since there are no stone digger spirits, this will do nicely. After all, the Mimic tier is technically under the same restrictions as I am, and it'll be nice to have a friend in this chaotic world. With all my collecting, I was able to get enough materials to immediately upgrade it to plus four, so between that and the tier, things are starting to look up. And then back down again as I enter Shifra River's boss arena. Oh, hi, Moog. What are you doing here? I give him a solid attempt, having completely neglected to upgrade my flask or use my new friend, but I think it's pretty clear that I won't be able to beat him just yet. Even his biggest openings don't guarantee a safe attack with this spell, and it doesn't take too long for him to destroy me. After that, I felt lost again and wandered around for another hour and a half until I remembered there's a whole section of Liurnia that I just kind, kind of forgot, forgot about. about. Remember the Carrion Study Hall? Uh, yeah, me neither. Some idiot stole the key to Hogwarts and died in the rafters, so inconsiderate. But with the key in hand, it's finally time to go to school. The merchant here doesn't have anything interesting for me, so I head straight to the Red Wolf's arena. This is usually a pretty easy boss, but this time Loretta's just hanging out in the hall. Kind of rude to bring a horse inside the building, but with a suit of armor like that, hey, I wouldn't try to kick her out either. This is a perfect example of a boss that has just enough mobility and speed to outpace me. When I get her caught in a three-hit combo, I can usually sneak around to her other side and get a hit off. It's always risky though and very slow, because I only get one opportunity at a time and she just turns around and smacks me anyway. And if I don't make it all the way around, I get my face crushed by her horse. On top of that, I'm kinda bad and impatient and take a bunch of unnecessary hits. On top of all of that, she's somewhat resistant to magic damage and my flasks are still pretty garbage. So while I do think this is very doable, I decide to put her off until later. I'm a little over eight hours into the run and feeling regretful of my choices. This spell sucks butts, y'all. Sure, it has some poise on cast so I can trade hits, but Elden Ring isn't very conducive to hit trading, and the lack of flask upgrades has been extremely tough to deal with. But hey, 
This is what I signed up for, and it hasn't been all hopeless. Lots of wasted time wandering, but with each piece of garbage I pick up and each boss killed that drops trash, that's one less place I've got to check. So it's not like I've made zero progress. But I gotta say, it doesn't feel good knowing that for most of the major bosses I've encountered, I've had to walk away. But that will make my eventual revenge all the sweeter. With Loretta put on pause for now, there's one last big place I haven't checked out yet that I keep on forgetting about. It's just across the street from the study hall, Einzel River. There's not much going on here, lots of stuff to pick up, but most of it's worthless. However, there is a merchant here, and he's a really swell guy because he gives us our second sacred tier. I never thought I'd be celebrating flask upgrades like this, but here we are. Since this isn't a mini dungeon, there's a chance that the boss here is holding something important, so I head on down and it's the ghost of Godfrey? You know what? I'm done being a wimpy baby boy. It's time for me to finally rise to the occasion and down a boss. And Godfrey's ghost, out of all of them, should be more than doable. He's got extremely exploitable patterns and often swings too high to hit me, so let's get him down. It takes me a while to figure out the timing, but by sticking to his left leg as much as possible, you can bait out two attacks. The first is an overhead swing, which he sometimes follows up with a stronger, spinning overhead swing, and that second attack is what I want. I can strafe around this and start my cast as his axe lands to get the full damage before he can even respond. And even if he is fast enough to respond, it's usually with his two-hit combo swing that swings right over my head, allowing me to get out safely. That two-hit combo is the other attack that I want to punish. I strafe around his left and have a narrow window to start my cast at just the right time to hit and get back to safety. Because this spell is so slow, I can only get one hit at a time before I have to start praying for more opportunities opportunities again. It's slow, but it's consistent. And on my fourth attempt, he goes down after eight minutes. And he drops a memory stone. And the chest he was guarding wasn't any better. Oh well, job's done and we don't have to worry about this place anymore. I decided that my next goal will be to take out patches for his bell bearing, which is done easily enough. He doesn't put up much of a fight, but it's a good thing that I took the time because he was holding on to the magic damage crystal tier for my physic, which I don't purchase immediately for some reason, but I will eventually. I spend the next hour or so wandering around picking up litter until I realize that Castle Morn, down on the Weeping Peninsula, isn't a mini dungeon. I'm a decent level now, so it shouldn't be too hard, so I make my way there, climb to the bottom, and who else is waiting for me but Horalu. I'm actually glad to see him here because this is such a low level area and he's so fast that I don't know how I'd beat him with this build if he showed up later. He doesn't hit like much of a warrior in this area and his health is pretty low so he's dead pretty quickly and for my troubles I finally get my first piece of the Dectus medallion? Let's go. All I gotta do now is hope to stumble onto the other half. I then decided to dip into the high road cave in northern Limgrave for some reason. I'm not sure why. Uh, there's bound not to be anything useful in here since I excluded it from the important items list, but I, I guess I'm glad that I came here. Uh, I don't get anything useful, but I do get a chance to practice fighting with my Mimic tier. This boss wound up being pretty hard, too. It's the duo that's normally hanging out in Redmain Castle, the Leonin Misbegotten, and his friend the Crucible Knight. My strategy here was to burst down the Misbegotten as much as possible before the knight joins in, and it took a decent number of attempts until I got an idea. There are a bunch of rock-based consumable items in Elden Ring that scale with intelligence and can expand my arsenal past this slow spell. One of the merchants I found has a collection of large glintstone scraps, which you can crush to spawn projectiles. The main problem right now is that the merchant has a very limited supply, and they're pretty dang expensive at this point in the game. Fortunately for me, my mimic spawns in with everything that I have equipped and can use them without affecting my own supply. His scraps are much weaker than mine are though, but damage is damage. By this point I'm desperate to have a collection of rocks to chuck at my enemies, but I haven't been fortunate enough to find a supplier yet, but at least I can still use what I have somewhat indirectly. Anyway, after the misbegotten goes down, it's the Crucible Knight's turn. My Mimic has been tanking him while I finish off the misbegotten, so I take the opportunity to poke at his back while I can, but the Mimic is dead pretty quickly. 
The knight's moveset is so fast that without the mimic, it's practically impossible for me to punish any of his moves without just trading damage, and with my baby flasks and low health pull, that ends up being a problem. Eventually, I decided it'd be a good idea to put on a shield and use parries to give me a better punish window, and with that, after a handful of attempts, the duo finally goes down. They dropped a nice weapon, though. Too bad I don't know how to use swords. I feel a little bad, though. That duo used to live in a castle, and they were kicked out and forced to live at the bottom of some nasty cave. So, in their honor, I decided to go back to evict the new residents. These guys were pretty squishy, and even better, this spell can stagger them with its pre-explosion hitbox. With my Mimic taking the heat of the second enemy off me, I managed to find enough damage windows to get them down in just two attempts. They were more useful than our cave friends, though, because they dropped the first imbued sword key. I don't know how useful they are yet, but they're nice to have for when I need places to check later on. And now, it's time to go back to Loretta and try to get her out of the way. I figured a boss in Kaelid should be harder than a boss in Hogwarts, so it shouldn't be too hard with my new friend. With the Mimic tier, these fights against horse-mounted knights become a lot easier to manage. While the Mimic is alive, we trade aggro, and while the Mimic has aggro, I would run to the opposite side of the boss and unload until it wasn't safe anymore. The Mimic would usually die around halfway into the fight, and from there I've got to deal with her alone. No problem, using the tricks I learned from my first attempts, I would wait patiently for her to throw a melee combo at me and juke to the other side for some damage. She's got quite a few openings and her magic imbued attack, while devastating if it hits, winds up being a huge punish window for me. Things are looking rough, but I was right. This is easy. All I gotta do is be patient, not get sloppy, and wait for an opening and... That one hurts. The next fights don't go quite as smoothly as the first one did. Something I'm learning about fighting with the Mimic tier is that how useful it is is kinda down to RNG. Does it choose the right time to attack? Does it use its consumables? Does it dodge? Who knows? On the seventh attempt though, after a five minute fight, Loretta goes down. Why was she holding the curse mark of death? Loretta, what were you doing here? Normally, I'd run straight to Renala from here, but you never know where you'll find a useful talisman or a flask upgrade, so I take the time to comb through the academy to steal everything that isn't nailed down, which nets us our third sacred tier. Now we can head up the elevator and who do we find? Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah, no. I know baby boy time was over earlier, but I, I, I'm bringing it back. I'll see you later, Valiant Gargoyles! At least now that Raya Lucaria is unlocked, that means I can take a trip to the Volcano Manor too. All I gotta do is die at the bottom and I'll be whisked away. I don't know what I'm hoping to find here, I just hope that I find something. I don't. Well, I mean, I guess that's not strictly true. As much as I say that these places were worthless or a bust to explore, all the golden runes and smithing stones I find are very useful. Edible runes are always welcome since they can help me purchase things in a pinch and also squeak out an extra level or two as needed. But I need great runes. I need smithing stone bell bearings. I need a way to the plateau. None of that here, though. At least on the ground. At the bottom of the manor is a magma worm. I put up a good fight, but decide to leave him for later. But blocking progress to the deeper portion of the manor is another boss I was terrified of when starting this run. I'll give you a hint. She's a 10, but her dance is more horrifying than a room of 10-year-olds showing you how much they love Fortnite. Hello, Melania. Uh, goodbye, Melania. It's worth noting that the randomizer gives you an option to turn her healing off, and even though I really, really wanted to, I just couldn't do it. So that means I can't do this fight, at least not yet. Anyway, Moog is next on the chopping block. I'm hoping that with my Mimic, this will be doable. I finally purchased the Magic Damage Crystal tier for my Physic and load it in, and I also buy a few Cuckoo Glintstones and equip all of my best rocks, most of which I found while out and about, to my toolbar for my Mimic to have a field day with. Unfortunately, the Mimic doesn't last long in this fight, so I gotta find my own safe attacking windows. Moog isn't very nice about this, though. The two main attacks that I found to punish are his Stab and his Overhead Swing. For both of these, I roll into his right and cast. This is inconsistent, though. Moog can choose one of four options here. Two are good, two are bad. For good options, he can either cast Blood Rain, which is super easy to dodge, or he can immediately swing, which just goes over my head and allows me to dodge away before his follow-up ground stab. For bad options, he can immediately swing with a back step, which will always hit me, or he can use the fast version of his Blood Flame Claw, which will also always hit me. As long as I dodge most of his attacks, it's doable, but pretty much up to RNGesus now, and for this first attempt, he wasn't on my side. 
The second attempt was looking better, but still extremely inconsistent. I got him pretty low, but I was down to just one remaining flask. And remember, my flasks are still crap, so they only heal about half of my already tiny health bar. So I do what any self-respecting gamer does. I get scared and start running. But I have all these rocks now. Their range and damage aren't that bad, and they're quite a bit quicker and safer than my spell, so I started chucking. These gravity stone fans are pretty slick. They only hit once, but they hit in a wide area and come out quickly. I started using these because I can replace them easily for 400 runes apiece, which is still kind of a lot at this point in the game, but much more expendable than anything else I currently have available. After I'm forced to use my final flask after making a very poorly executed attack, I ran out even further and wasted some of my precious, currently unrenewable, Cuckoo Glintstones for the kill. Whew, that was a rough 9 minute fight, but I'm happy to finally be chucking rocks. We even got our fourth sacred tier as a reward, hot damn. As nice as that reward is right now, it doesn't really get me any closer to making progress, and now I'm really out of ideas. So I spent the better part of the next two hours hunting down all the field bosses that I know about. I tried the dragon in Limgrave's swamp, but he ended up calling in support from his friend nearby, so that was a bust. I managed to kill Crucible Knight Electo, a Knight's Deathbird, and the Omen Killer Dragonkin Soldier, who is hanging out in probably the worst arena I could imagine for him, aside from maybe Margit's. Seriously, it took me half an hour to figure out how to take this guy out, partially because the space was so cramped. And finally, I went to kill the Erdtree Godskin Apostle, who was actually in a pretty nice arena, but this boss is way too fast for me to ever safely punish. He'd constantly jump away before an explosion hit, or just smack me around for free every time I tried. Of course, though, that's why our Mimic Friend is here. He's dead by the time the Apostle reaches Phase 2, but I learned that by waiting for it to use this attack, I could roll through it and get an easy punish. Unfortunately, all of these dropped trash, so I guess I just gotta buckle down and choose between Estelle, Rikert, and Placidusax if I want to move forward now. Oh boy. This whole time, I've been making trips back to both Rikert and Placidusax every now and again to see how I'd fare against them. And while I can squeak out a little more damage each time, I've never even gotten close to winning. So, Estelle it is. This Celestial Nerd's Rope should have the least amount of health between these three titans, at the cost of being harder to actually approach and hit. Thankfully, he's pretty slow, and his hitboxes are actually somewhat generous despite his shape, so this fight wound up being not so bad. The Mimic tier ends up dying extremely quickly, so I'm on my own for a majority of this fight. He's got more than enough punish windows for me to exploit, so before too long, the fight started feeling extremely possible. The biggest problem, though, is his meteor attack, which will still devastate my health bar, but the high walls of this arena end up saving my skin more often than not, because I'm really not sure what the intended dodging strategy is supposed to be for a literal meteor shower. After about a 10 minute fight on my fifth attempt, Estelle goes down, and I can say hi to my future wife, Ronnie. But isn't something missing out here? There's supposed to be a boss patrolling around, but it's nowhere to be seen. Well, that's because on my first attempt against Estelle, he decided to teleport out of the arena to deal with it for me. What a bro. Unfortunately, there's nothing interesting on this side of the manor, but at least the deed is done for when this door opens up later. This did unlock a new merchant, though, and this guy had two very important items for me. Our fifth sacred tier, and the purifying crystal tier, just in case I find Moog somewhere in my way. Against my better judgment, I decide to take on Rikard next. I've leveled up enough that he hits like the absolute noodle that he is, but my own damage output is still going to be a problem. I have an idea, though. My Mimic loves to throw rocks, and one of the merchants I killed in cold blood has infinite poison stones for sale. The problem is, they're 2,000 runes apiece. Not very economical, but if I just buy a stack and never use them, there's a chance that my friend can do the poisoning for me. I know this is a long shot though, because in my last video I went on a whole tangent about how poison sucks so bad that three instances of it only deals about 22% of Rikard's maximum health and damage, at least at his normal health values. It should be slightly better here because of his lower health pull, but I don't expect to get three poisonings off, and even if I did, that's still three quarters of his health that I'd have to melt normally, and I haven't even gotten close to halfway yet. Until now. 
I took two attempts at Rikard this time, and with the help of the poison, I did get him down to half health both times. That's definitely some progress, but it takes literally all of my flasks. And even though he does hit like a wet noodle, his skull rain phase is still a nightmare. Skulls don't come down, thank god, but that attack also spawns a bunch of explosions on the ground. Normally, it's not a big deal, you would just run away. And even here, you'd think, well, big whoop, just dodge him, right? Well, yes, but also no. This attack of his seems to spawn a consistent amount of explosions on the available ground in a wide area. Unfortunately, we're in an arena with very little available ground, and so they're all clumped up on Margit's landing strip. On top of that, I can't even see the dang ground through his lava, much less the same colored explosions coming from underneath. Out of all his attacks, these do the most damage and are the reason I can't come into this fight with less healing flasks, so there's only one thing left to do. Hello, Placidious Axe. I wish I could say it's nice to see you, but I hate you and I must kill you. Gosh golly, this fight sucked dragon dick. This arena is extremely cramped compared to this boss's normal home, so much so that it's impossible to run away from his nuke if you lose your bearings and take off in the wrong direction. He's always close to a wall, so it can be hard to maneuver to safe punish positions, and this spell is so slow that I'm lucky to get a single hit off between his lightning strikes and get out safely. There's plenty of openings here, but as much damage as he does, I'm fighting the arena just as much as Placidious Axe himself. I was never able to find the materials to upgrade my Mimic Past plus 4, so it melts extremely quickly, and honestly, I probably would have just been better off without it since it makes the boss so much less predictable in its attacks and movements, and I don't really have the health to spare on a stray hit. I've got no choice left though but to grind this boss until I win, but as long as I play well and play safe, it's more than doable at this point. On each attempt I get further and further and further, I find my openings, I learn the dodge windows, and I improve. It turns out that the size of this arena screws both of us over pretty equally. His second dive bomb has such a huge range that he ends up outside of the arena entirely, completely nullifying the attack. I was hoping this would just kill him, but I'm not that lucky. Instead, it's just an extremely stressful few moments of waiting for the game to teleport him back into the arena, or for him to teleport himself with his quick teleport attacks. There's no telling where he'll come from though, so I would just spin my camera in a panic, listening closely to the sound cues just in case. Towards the end of the fight, Placidusucks likes to fire his laser, but this tiny arena completely breaks the AI half the time and will often cause him to just barf on the wall instead. That works for me, free damage. After around an hour of grinding, I finally get lasered through a wall. Are you kidding me? That goes through... <sighs> nice. I wanted to keep going at this point, but it was like 3 a.m. on a work night and I've already been trapped in this one more attempt loop for too long. That's fine though, I came back the next day and one-shot him with the help of his wall barf tech. Thanks for the golden seed, idiot. Ugh, that was not easy though. So finally, as I pass the 18 hour mark of this cursed run, I'm finally free to explore Altus Plateau. Finally! I've never been so happy to see the piss-stained fields of lightning country as I am now. Well, time to explore. It's the same strategy here as everywhere else I've been. Obsessively trudge every inch of the zone in hopes that I find something good. Every ruin, every church, every corpse. As usual, most of the things I pick up aren't helpful in the least, but now that I'm in a higher tier zone, there are higher tier smithing stones to find, so if nothing else, that's a huge positive. Plus, there are plenty more bosses to find and fight. I'll spare you all the less exciting details, but I did find our sixth sacred tier at the base of one of the golden trees behind the walls, and over in the Stormcaller Church, I stumbled upon one of the most important items I could find, the Pure Blood Knight's Medal. In case you don't know, this normally comes from Vare's quest line and can teleport you straight to an endgame zone, Mogwin Palace. We'll save this for later though, since there's plenty to do now that I've set foot in Altus. The only field boss I managed to take down on this go-around is a putrid Erd tree in Windmill Village, and then I head to the Shaded Castle, avoiding a familiar face along the way, to pick up all of its goodies and say hi to the boss hiding at the top. 
Unfortunately, it's these things. Here's another great example of a boss that's normally easy, but is a little too fast for me to punish. Kind of weird considering that they're mostly immobile hunks of stone. The only consistently safe opening I could find is this creepy Ridley up taunt, but I don't have the luxury of playing safely since I'm on a timer in the form of my Mimic's health bar, and there's no way I can handle them both myself. Despite the best efforts of me and my doppelganger, this just isn't going to happen right now. So I head out to explore the rest of the area around the castle before heading back to Redmayne for a party. Radon is looking a little more rough for wear these days, huh? I decided to give this guy a try solo to see what I can do, since, after all, I was almost able to beat the magma worm at the bottom of Volcano Manor. How bad could it be? Oh, he's standing up. I forgot about that. And worse, I don't know how to fight it yet. Ouch. But you know what? This is a party, dang it. I've never fought Radon with the raid party before, so why not now? So I summon in the raid and it goes pretty well until it doesn't. And these guys must be new to raiding because as everyone who raids already knows, don't stand in the fire. It's kind of funny that the first time that I'm ever willing to bring these guys in to help, it turns out that their AI just doesn't know what magma is and they just melt to the onslaught. It's fine though, I can basically just summon them again forever and eventually Star Scar Sorge I actually wrote Scar Sorge? What the hell is that? Star Sorge Makar bites the dust. Why did I write Scar Sorge? It got a little touchy there for a while though, because in phase two, the summon signs started being difficult and didn't want to consistently show up. But he was down on the fourth attempt. He dropped a bunch of neat stuff too, including the unalloyed golden needle. So before heading into the giant new hole in the ground, I decided to try and start Millicent's questline, and it seemed that, to do that, I had to go and defeat whoever's replacing Commander O'Neill. That turned out to be a draconic tree sentinel, and it's just way too quick for my main method of dealing damage. The only reason I got him this low is because of the mimic. Not even the Loretta strategy of circling around him during his attacks would work. His combos just aren't long enough, and... He likes to shoot fireballs way quicker than I can actually cast a spell. Oh well, off to Nakron. Nakron turns out to be a great time. I sure love getting shoved off a sideways building by a tree spirit. All I wanted to do was pick up items, man, come on. Just a little past that guy, I ended up finding our first staff upgrade of the run. The Demi-Human Queen Staff. Double checking the wiki right now, this may have been a mistake since it's apparently only stronger than my starter staff with a low intelligence score. Whoops but I was convinced at the time that this was better and it was an upgrade. It'll be a while before we can use it though, since I'm painfully short on smithing stones since I spent them all in my starter staff. Regardless, I'm glad to have it. And then we pick a fight with the Mimic Ancestor Spirit. This guy is kind of a pain. Not difficult to dodge, just very difficult to actually hit with my Rock Blaster. He's got a bad habit of bouncing away before the explosion, making me waste my precious FP. I'm able to find a few good openings though, and on my third attempt, after around five and a half minutes of fighting, the spirit goes down. A golden seed from that thing is a decent enough reward, but even better is the Pearl Drake Talisman Plus Two that pops out of this beetle on the bridge, and the Crimson Seed Talisman at the end of this broken bridge. The Pearl Drake Plus 2 is going to be a great defensive talisman for elemental focused bosses, and the Crimson Seed Talisman is going to be hugely important if I keep suffering on sacred tier pickups, since it increases the amount of healing that my flasks grant. While I'm here, I take the time to light all the torches in the area to see who's in the boss arena, and no thanks, you guys can rot here forever for all I care. Yeah, I sure hope I don't have to come back and fight them eventually. So I finish combing through the area and eventually make my way all the way down to where the Valiant Gargoyles usually live to fight the Valiant Red Wolf. In most runs, this boss is extremely easy. This pooch has a ton of openings and its attacks are generally pretty easy to read. And on top of that, it has an extremely small health pull. The problem is though, it's extremely mobile. This dog bounces all over the place, all the time, and because my main attack spell is so ridiculously slow, I was actually extremely worried about fighting this boss. And it was exactly as difficult to hit as I imagined it would be. Luckily though, my Mimic can survive for most of the fight this time around, so it's possible to get in a lot of damage while the Mimic tanks for me. Easier said than done since the boss often moves around just enough during its attacks that I end up wasting precious FP, or simply swings so wide that I get bopped anyway. But on my fourth attempt after a little over three and a half minutes, the Valiant Red Wolf bestows upon us our very first great rune. 
Finally! Don't get me wrong, I know I've technically been making pretty decent progress this whole time, but it felt so, so good to finally get a great rune. Remember, I need two of these to even enter the capital, and I need all seven to beat the game because of the settings that I chose for this run. With one great rune acquired, I jump into this coffin to take a ride and unlock the deep root depths for later and head back into the world to kill a few field bosses that I left behind, starting with this Tibia Tree Sentinel. We've pretty well outleveled this place, so my Mimic and I make short work of it and... Is that a smithing stone bell bearing? I've got smithing stone ones and twos for days, so what this bell bearing allows me to buy isn't all that important, but something else very important unlocks by turning this in. After handing the bell over to the twin maiden husks, you're able to buy glintstone scraps from them for just 300 runes apiece. Extremely cheap at this point in the game, and between this and the gravity stone fans, I have an extremely limited but infinitely renewable source of quicker range damage to use in a pinch. Come to think of it, I probably should have used some of those fans against the dog. Whoops. Next, I head back to Altus and run to the minor Erd tree in the zone to fight the boss with the single best name I've ever seen, Assassin Face. It's an annoying fight, but pretty easy since these enemies can be stunned by my Rock Blaster and I get a Golden Seed for my trouble. I also attempt to fight what is normally a dragon near the Stormcaller Church, but turns out to be just a completely different dragon, and I just ended up running away after chucking all my flasks. Dragons are pretty tough with this build, as it turns out, and just in case it has a great rune, I decide to go and kill the Draconic Putrid Avatar in front of Landell. No great rune, but at least I've got the grace for when I can finally move forward. Now that Altus is mostly cleared, it's finally time to make use of that Pure Blood Knight's Medal to take a visit to Mogwin and clean up there. Not much in this zone other than higher level stones and runes, but there is a merchant here with poison stone clumps, and they're only 200 runes apiece? I'll take your entire stock! Well, I can't exactly take the whole stock since it's technically infinite, but I do buy as many as I can afford and then make the mistake of trying to kill the merchant so I never have to come back here. Well, I should have known better, I'm not quite strong enough for this place and he's got poise for days. I end up with 114 stone clumps though, and that should be enough to last us for quite a while. Just for giggles, I go to see who's hanging out at the top of this palace and... Margit. Hey, you got a promotion! Good for you, man! This won't be an easy fight, but that's for later me to worry about, so I head back down to the deep root depths to clean it out. Similarly to Mogwin, not much to find here but rocks and runes, but I do finally get my hands on a Ghost Glove Wart 5, which is all I need to boost my doppelganger from plus 4 all the way to plus 9. And up in the boss arena, it turns out that Fia and Renala are BFFFs forever, and Renala has come to defend Fia's honor. Very successfully, it turns out. So this is a dead end for now. Back to Altus to kill a Magma Worm Kindred, which was a pretty tough fight until it glitched out and somehow lost its weapon and got caught in a loop. It only dropped a rune arc though, so it kind of deserved the embarrassment it got. As difficult as this fight was though, I'm not really confident in my ability to take out the rest of the field bosses in this zone. So I head back to Stormvale for another round with Snake Daddy Rikard. Between the Dragon Crest and Pearl Drake Talismans significantly boosting my defenses on top of all of the levels I've gained over the past however many hours, the amount of damage that this guy is dealing to me this time around is laughable. Still, with the size of this arena and the pure chaos of the exploding ground, I chug through most of my healing flasks, and I still chew through all of my blue over the course of this chonker's chunky health bar. And luckily, my mimic is all too happy to apply all the poison, so I don't have to. Towards the end of this fight, after chugging my last blue flask, I decided to conserve my mana just a bit and see how useful these glintstone scraps are. Oh yeah, that's nice. That's real nice. It's not a ton of damage, but the ability to dish out anything from a safer range and with a safer speed is huge. This was my first attempt this time around, and Rikard finally goes down after a 6 minute fight. It took me nearly 23 hours just to get inside Stormvale. Ridiculous. It's worth noting that even though I did find a Ghost Glovewort 5 in Deep Root before heading to Rikard, I couldn't find the footage of me upgrading the Mimic to plus 9. That means I must have fought and defeated Rikard without the upgrades and just upgraded the Mimic off camera afterwards. We finally have access to Stormvale, but it doesn't really have much to offer. Regardless, I did take the time to pick up everything I could and... Hey, what's this? 
Well, that sure would have been useful like 20 hours ago. Thanks, game. <laughs> Godric has moved out of his castle, and in his place is Phase 1, Renala. And she goes down about as easy as you would expect. The Golden Seed is nice, but overall Stormvale was kind of a bust. But since I fought Renala here, I felt inspired to head back to Hogwarts and fight the true queens of the full moon. These valiant gargoyles are a pain in their normal arena, but much like Placidusucks guarding the entrance to the Altus Plateau, this arena is miserable for these bosses. If they were just normal gargoyles, I think they'd be fine, but these jerks like to spew poison everywhere and gang up on you for no reason. Extremely rude, but on my third attempt, I managed to finesse the gargoyles enough to keep my mimic alive and clutch out the vi Oh yeah, there's a phase two, isn't there? Crap, I, I didn't plan for this. Luckily, I somehow managed to pull five healing flasks through to this next phase, so I'm feeling all right, and Fia's champions? Well, I wasn't expecting that. The first champion goes down easy. He's mostly melee, and since he's a human character, he gets staggered pretty easily from the Rock Blaster. The second champion, though, is Roger, and he's got a ton of ranged spells to make my life difficult with. He's too dangerous to charge up a Rock Blaster, but lucky for me, he doesn't know how to properly dodge most of my rocks. And then he makes the mistake of moving in for a kiss, so I can take the opportunity to chunk the last third of his health bar. The party for three is where this fight gets extremely dicey. These dudes hit pretty hard, and I've already used half of my fans on Roger, which would have been better saved for this part of the fight since they can sometimes hit more than one enemy at a time. They're hyper-aggressive, and even though these rocks of mine are faster than my spell, they're still dangerously slow, so I'm bleeding flasks. They're splitting up a lot, so I eventually switch tactics and waste some of my precious Cuckoo Glintstones to try and kill the caster, which works. But if I die on this run, I won't have them as a resource for the next attempt, which really, really scares me. With the caster dead, I switch over to my gravity stone chunks, which were sold to me for a cheap 400 runes per rock by the merchant on Mount Gelmir. These do a ton of damage if they hit, but because they're thrown directly at the enemy, and these enemies like to dodge, and the explosion that comes from the rock is delayed, the explosion hitting mostly comes down to two parts luck and one part timing. Good thing luck was on my side this time because this shield bro ended up taking the rock meant for his friend and got chunked for half of his health, which basically saved my life. That was way, way more damage than I expected, both on me and on the enemy. So after fleeing to get some drinks in, I blast the shield bro down and I kill the last champion with another gravity chunk. Whew, those guys were way harder than I thought they'd be. Really glad I was able to use my rock collection to clutch it out, though. No great rune from these guys, but we did get our seventh sacred tier. I'm back to search mode, so I head back to Volcano Manor to take out the Magma Worm, and... Wait, you're telling me I could have just killed this guy to get into Altus? But I need great runes. I need smithing stone bell bearings. I need a way to the plateau. None of that here, though. Well, now I feel like an idiot. Well... While I'm here, I remember there's another Tibia Tree Sentinel wandering nearby, and holy crap was this guy hard. He hits like a truck, and his Shield Slam ability is super hard to dodge. More often than not, my Mimic would die before getting him to half health, leaving me to die lonely and runeless. Eventually, though, I take it down for a Somber Stone Bell Bearing, uh, which is useless. At this point, I decided to give Kale 14,000 of my hard-earned runes for a hint. And he tells me that there's a required item somewhere in Altus. Well, there's one real place that I can think of, so I head back to the top of the Shaded Castle to fight the creepy cats. I'm much better equipped this time around, so it shouldn't be too hard. My poor Mimic is dead before I even get one of them to half health, and he barely even touched his food. My extensive rock collection was the absolute MVP of this fight. My strategy was simple. Run in circles like a big old baby boy and get them as stoned as possible. It took all of my glintstone scraps and gravity fans to take out the caster, and with one dead, this fight gets a lot easier. For the rest of the fight, I throw my gravity chunks until I run out, moving in for a rock blaster when the opportunity presents itself. I waste too many of my chunks on an impatient toss that would never work, and resort to throwing a bunch of poison clumps to chip it down for the win. Okay, I'll admit that wasn't easy, but that was the first attempt, so I'm happy. And is that the second great rune? Oh yeah, things are really starting to move now. Finally, nearly 26 hours into this run, and we head into the city of Landel. At last, the city of Lindel. 
This has been a long time coming, a journey that took me across the world in a way that I haven't seen since my first playthrough. As usual, I take a full tour of the city to pick up all the litter that its citizens so carelessly discarded, and up at the mysterious Colosseum, I find yet another important tool for this run, the Glintstone Craftsman's Cookbook 1. This book gives me the ability to craft cuckoo glintstones, which I do immediately. Unfortunately, as you may have noticed, all the farmable materials and flowers of this world are just as randomized as the enemies and the items, so that puts a little bit of a kibosh on any idea of having an infinite supply of these things. Regardless, it's great to have the option to use these, and if worst comes to worst, I can always take the time to hunt down a good spot to find what I need. And with Landel mostly cleaned up, it's time to head up, 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 and find... Godric? Jeez, he's so desperate for the throne that he's come up here to attempt to dethrone Morgoth. We can't have that, now can we? Well, maybe we can for now. This feels extremely possible, and I haven't bothered to summon my Mimic, but I would like to come back when I upgrade my weapon a little bit. Side note, fire is complete nonsense in this game. I never know what to do, it just goes crazy every time. Anyway, putting Godric back into the death queue, I head down to the sewers. It's funny how this randomizer works. Some places are much easier to navigate than they've ever been because the enemies were specifically designed to stop you, but others are much harder because the enemies were specifically designed to be literally anywhere else. Right here, I get stuck on one of the little beast runts, literally so small I couldn't see him behind the mage, who then takes advantage of my confusion and shotguns me right in the back. Hilarious. Oh well, nothing that a quick respawn can't fix, and after cleaning out the rest of the sewers, I head to the bottom and find, oh hello there, Radagon. I guess his quarterly reviews didn't go so well. I got a hold of the quarterly report, and it seems that he was demoted because killed by only briar armor. Oh, whoops, that's my bad. Uh, nothing personal, right? Okay, point taken. All right, let's put Radagon back on the Q2 and head back up to the city. I get lost here a lot, and during this run, I had a hard time finding one of the graces in the lower city that I know has some items next to it. And after wandering around for far too long, I finally find it. Now, what do we have here? Oh, hey, it's our third talisman pouch. And even better, just outside, I finally find the last smithing stone four I need for my new staff that I didn't know at the time is actually much worse than I was already using, allowing me to push it all the way to plus 23. Even though it's technically worse at equivalent upgrade stats, it's still better than the plus 14 I was using before, so it's still an upgrade and it's time to return to Godric. This fight was more stressful than I expected it to be. Godric has a few openings that are just long enough to exploit, but just barely. If I time my spell incorrectly, the whirlwind attack that Godric would respond with like 90% of the time would smack me for an uncomfortable amount of my health. It's not an enormous amount, but I can't afford to be hit by it too often considering how much it comes out. Sometimes I can roll out safely, other times I just can't. Other than that, the strategy was just to stay at an optimal range to punish his mistakes, while still being able to get behind him for his fire lawnmower attack. And on my second attempt this time around, fourth overall, after an eight and a half minute fight, Godric is defeated. Up next is the king of Landel himself, Fire Giant Phase 2. I was wondering when you'd show up. My Elden Roll training came in clutch here. This arena is tiny, which seems like it would be a problem for such a large boss, but since he's always so close, it's pretty easy for me to get into melee range and blast the giant's hands. And he's just barely slow enough for me to consistently get a hit off safely. It was a bit messy, but I didn't even bother with the mimic or the poison rocks, and just took him out the old-fashioned way in a single five and a half minute attempt. The mountaintop of the giants is up next. All I gotta do is talk to Melina here and she'll give me... Wait, that's not the rolled lift ticket. Uh, crap, not this again. Time for another field boss killing spree, I guess. Demi-human queen omen killer. Garbage. Falling star dragonkin soldier. Trash. The pair of bosses guarding the walls of Landell. Useless. Extremely difficult and not worth my time, but still useless. Full-grown Erdtree Avatar. Pointless. Ulcerated Kindred. Oh, hey, now we're getting somewhere. This is my second imbued key. Uh, might as well use them. I'm gonna try these in descending order. And the first one takes me back to Shifra River where... Wait, there was a great rune here this whole time? That's our third one, nice. The second one takes me back to the start where I embarrass the soldier of Godric and steal his wedding ring for the love of my life, which reminds me, I should have everything I need to visit Noxtella now. 
As usual, nothing but crap litters the ground here and all the way at the bottom, through the ruined city and past the Lake of Rot, is Neil, natural born of the void. I always knew something was off about you. This is another boss I was worried about, just because of his cronies. Luckily, the Berserker Bro charges me recklessly and dies for it, but the Shield Bro ends up being a little bit more of a problem. Eventually, my Mimic helps me separate them and he goes down too. Neil then very rudely takes the time out of his day to kill my Mimic before transitioning to Phase 2, where I couldn't for the life of me find any safe openings for my Rock Blaster. I was sure there would be something, but every attack is followed by a swipe, or a frosty wind attack, so I resort to rocking him with my collection. Poison is always nice, and the glintstones do a good job of taking a chunk out of his health before I finally run out. Luckily, his wind doesn't deflect any of my projectiles, and his attacks are easy enough to avoid. So after two poisonings, my rock collection was more than enough to bring him down. Neil himself didn't have anything useful for me, but the place he was protecting did. Not only did I get married to a puppet, but I also found the Erd Tree Favor Plus 2. This thing gives me a decent amount of extra health, stamina, and equip load, allowing me to further procrastinate on the idea of dumping any points into endurance and giving me a little more protection for my trades. I took a couple of cracks at this dragon up here, but it turned out to be too much for me, so I let it live. At this point, I'm starting to run out of ideas again, but there are a few bosses that I can still return to now that I'm more powerful. First, Godskin Melania. We all already know how difficult Melania is, and even though my Rock Blaster is pretty good at staggering her, it's just not enough to outpace her self-healing and high damage. What's worse is that the speed of this spell makes me extremely vulnerable to not just any potential retaliation, but puts me in a terrible position to dodge Waterfowl Dance if she chooses to use it. And that's not even taking into account the size and shape of this arena, making it very, very difficult to dodge waterfowl under normal circumstances. I spent an hour here and didn't even get close to even pushing her into phase two, but I guess I can always return later. Hopefully she's not guarding the rolled lift ticket. Well, back to Mogwin, I guess. I'm running low on poison stone clumps, so I go and finish off the merchant that I angered earlier in the run. This wasn't easy. His madness spell gives him a ton of poise, and he absolutely destroys my doppelganger, so eventually I just resorted to hit and run tactics with my rock collection and took him out that way so I can finally restock my clump collection. Alright, Margit's turn. You know, I think we all take Margit for granted, if I'm being honest. He normally appears so early in the game, it's easy to brush him off, but Margit has some of the hardest patterns to dodge in the entire game. He's not just the same as Morgoth either. They're very similar, but Morgoth's got slightly different attack patterns and a few bigger attack patterns with more consistent openings, which, in my opinion, makes him slightly easier than his little brother. The main culprits are, one, his big spinning attack in phase two, which I always manage to dodge incorrectly, and two, his stab swipe stab combo that I'm convinced is 100% undodgeable if you're forced to roll through the first two swings, and then three, his dagger cancels. Much like the beast clergyman, Margit likes to cancel a lot of his combos into a few dagger swipes if you end up too close to or behind him before he finishes the combo. This can make finding safe punish windows a lot more difficult. Thankfully, there are a couple of guaranteed windows even with this slow spell. The first is the attack where he charges up for like three years. If you're close enough, you can just strafe it, but if you're too far, he'll charge and force a roll. Ideally, you're close enough to react and strafe it for a really big damage opportunity. The second is this two-hit combo that he starts with a vertical swipe upward. If you stay in position, you can dodge that first swipe and strafe him to avoid the follow-up, resulting in another big damage window. This one is more difficult to exploit though, because if you're not close enough to him after the first attack, he'll simply end the combo early. This means if you want to use this opportunity, you have to try to bait out the attack and react correctly, which puts you in all sorts of danger for the rest of his attacks. So that was my strategy. Rely on these two attacks for my opportunities, hope that I dodge enough to not die, and keep him poisoned as much as possible. On my second attempt, I got him really low before being forced to use my last flask, which is when I started to panic and started throwing rocks from relative safety. He likes to punish these with dagger throws, so I still have to choose attack windows wisely, but a handful of Cuckoo Glenstones do the job and Margit goes down. 
For my trouble, I get the Carrion Inverted Statue and 546,000 runes. That's real nice. So, with that statue in hand, I head back to the Carrion Academy. Surely my lift ticket is in here, right? No. This place had nothing interesting, but I do realize that I'm an idiot and that there's a whole snowy zone behind Landil before I even get to the Grand Lift of Rold. I'm not expecting to find the lift ticket here, but at least it's another place to explore before I throw my face at Melania for a few more hours. So I head on up to fight the boss in front of the lift, the Black Blade Avatar. Even though this is the more difficult, normal variety of Erdtree Avatar, I'm pretty well practiced with these guys by now. Unfortunately, this is the one that clones itself. That turned out to be much less of a problem than I thought it was, and my Mimic kept the clone busy while I finished off the first one, and to my surprise, <laughs> they share a health bar. I know that's pretty obvious looking at the footage here, but I wasn't really focused on that, so it was a pleasant surprise. Another pleasant surprise is that this guy had the fourth great rune. Uh, that was unexpected. Even more unexpected, on my way back down to pick up a few things that I missed on my way to this boss, I find the lift ticket just chilling here at the base of this tiny herd tree. Sorry, Melania, you're just gonna have to wait. The mountaintop adventures were relatively uneventful. There's a couple of falling star beasts in the area, one of which I kill successfully, before heading over to Castle Soul to clear it out. At the top of the castle is another ancestor spirit, which goes about the same way as the first one, and it drops the first half of the Halig Tree medallion for me. I sure hope I won't need the other half. Anyway, that's a problem for later. For now, we have a fire giant to take care of. Or at least whoever's made the fire giant's arena their home. A Leon and Misbegotten? Oh, this should be easy. Well, it's not. Luckily, I had some practice against this guy earlier in the run, and he can be staggered by my spell, but he's really fast, really aggressive, and hits really hard. My Mimic goes down extremely quickly, but luckily this thing's health is low enough that the damage is significant enough before the Mimic dies, and it's easy enough to finish off with a few rocks. That wasn't so bad. Oh, yeah. Phase 2, that's right. Oh, nope, 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 nope. I was extremely not prepared for the Elven Beast, but I was prepared for something potentially awful here, and I had gone out of my way to hang out with best boy Alexander so he can join me for this fight. Alexander deserves a shot at the Elven Beast, and I was all too happy to grant it. So, for the next attempt, I brought Alexander out, and, <laughs> and unfortunately, he doesn't really know what to do. He mostly just hangs out in one spot and takes a pot shot every time an enemy just kind of wanders into his zone. Jarbro didn't even get a single hit in for the entirety of this first phase of the fight. He, he tried though, I guess, and that's what matters. The Leonin misbegotten isn't why he's here though. Alexander is here for the Elden Beast. This fight was really, really weird. Alexander barely bothers to even move. So getting him to help is more of a matter of luck in what the Elden Beast decides to do more than anything. Until that happens, it's just a normal Elden Beast fight, just with added hills, avoid attacks, retaliate in kind. A short way into the fight though, the Elden Beast makes a crucial mistake and takes one right in the chin, instantly stunning him. The uppercut hit like a truck too, which is always super helpful. Unfortunately, Alexander has no idea what he just did, and when the beast wakes up and I run off to find a better position, Alexander is just kind of standing there looking confused. For the rest of the fight, it's just normal Elden Beast shenanigans. I chase it down, it runs away, it comes back, blah, blah, blah. Alexander is able to sneak in a few hits here and there, but not many. Every hit is enormous though, significantly shortening the fight, and after nine minutes against the Elden Beast itself, not counting phase one, of course, the boss goes down. This would have been easily extended to about 15 minutes or so without Alexander's few hits. They're just that devastating. Anyway, it's time to burn everything. This run needs to end. We're like 34 hours deep at this point, but the momentum is stronger than ever. Not much longer now. With the Fire Elden Beast defeated, we wake up in Season 3 of the Umbrella Academy and employ the usual strategy of litter removal. Luckily, Faramazula is small, so it shouldn't be much of an issue to pick up all the things, at least if there wasn't a stinking lobster spamming his op through the doorway. Eventually, it's all cleaned up, though, and it's time to head into the Godskin Duos arena, and in probably the funniest boss role of the entire run, we're faced with a Godskin Noble. Just one. What's wrong, Michelin man? Where's your brother? You shouldn't have come here without backup, idiot. Yeah, needless to say, this fight was pretty easy. 
To further insult him, I did bring out my Mimic tier just to show him the power of having a brother and tore him apart. Super satisfying. Since I've gone out of my way to give Alexander a proper warrior's life during this run, I can't end it without giving him a proper warrior's death too, so I'll go kill him. Don't worry, it's purely consensual. He didn't have anything useful, it's just about respect. I could probably finish out Faramazula at this point, but the craziness of this randomizer has got me a little paranoid, so I take a bit of a detour. I head back to Landel to give it one quick pass before I bury it in ash, and wouldn't you know it, I left a carrion regal scepter just laying on the ground over here. This is one of, if not the strongest staff in the game, so naturally I immediately max it out and equip it. Glad I took the time. And before heading back to Faramazula, I've got a bit of a revenge arc to go on. First, down to the sewers to take on Radagon, and very quickly I noticed something I didn't take into account. This new staff has a skill on it, spinning weapon. This isn't just any old spinning weapon though, this is Renala's spinning weapon, and it's really strong. I can stop myself from using it all I want, but my doppelganger has other ideas, and he really really likes it. On one hand, I kinda wanna throw this staff out since spinning weapon isn't mining equipment, but at the same time, I'm not the one using the skill now, am I? What my mimic does is between him and Marika, quite literally at this specific moment in time, uh, so I'll allow it. The Radagon fight was kind of interesting. I threw all my poison rocks and couldn't get a single poison off on him, which meant that pretty much all the damage that Radagon took by the time the mimic died was done by the mimic itself partially because of its new toy. I hit like a truck now though, so even though Radagon didn't give me many opportunities for this latter half of this fight, I made each one count. And when I had a window smaller than what was safe for a rock blaster, I still had my rock collection. Bye bye Radagon, it was nice knowing ya. Glad we came down here too, because he drops our fifth great rune. Two more to go. Next on the list is Renala, who really didn't want to die? In fact, she straight up just quit on me by teleporting herself outside of the battle arena and laughing at me. Look at her smug face. She's safe and I'm softlocked. I have literally no choice but to quit out and start the fight again. Oh well, she staggers very easily and between the spinning weapon and the rock blaster, she can't really do much for most of the fight and dies easily. Oh hey, the last talisman pouch. Thanks, Renala. And since I was already here and had the quest items to fight Fortisax, I decided to do that. No, shut up, I, I didn't do it just for the hug. You shut your mouth. I did it because I wanted to fight Radon, who died super easy and gave me nothing useful. Don't judge me. After that was this big dumb lizard in front of the old Erd tree and look, I didn't just say it was dumb just to be rude. This lizard was extremely difficult and I was actually questioning my ability to win when he decides to just, you know, win for me. It's okay, we take those. All I got was a pile of broken glass though, so that wasn't worth it. Oh well, back to Faramazula and our friend, the Beast Clergyman Dragonkin Soldier. This should be easy, we've already killed like three of these guys by now and... Oh, 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 we haven't fought him like this yet, he's going crazy! Still, this Dragonkin's Phase 2 retains all of its Phase 1 attacks, which I know how to punish pretty easily now, just with a little extra spice. I don't even bother with the Mimic for this guy, and he goes down after just seven minutes. <laughs> oh yeah, there's a second phase. Hello, Loretta. Feeling pretty happy that I didn't use my Mimic for the first half now. This time around, though, this is an endgame Loretta. She's fairly resistant to magic, and since this is the ghostly version, she's immune to any status effects that I care about, so it's not exactly a free fight. Still, though, I'm well practiced against these knights by now, magical or not, and after just under three minutes, she also goes down. One attempt, nice. I'm getting a little worried though, we're pulling up on the final bosses of the game and we still haven't seen Gideon yet. If you've watched enough of these challenge runs, you should know by now that Gideon is either brutally difficult or hilariously easy, and I suspect he'll be on the difficult side of things with this build. So let's just hope we don't run into him. Anyway, with Loretta Keth defeated, we wake up in the middle of a Texas summer and comb the city for loot. We're still stuck on a miserable plus seven flask, so I'm just desperately hoping to find at least one sacred tear just laying around, but I'm not that lucky. The city's clean and I'm sad, so it's time to head up to the next boss in Fortisex? I've honestly never fought this boss before, and I've failed every single dragon fight I've attempted in this run with the exception of Placidusux, who took a ton of work to defeat, so I'm a little scared. Our damage is pretty respectable though, so hopefully this won't be too... Hmm. Okay, let's just try that again. It's pretty funny fighting these giant bosses in these tiny arenas. 
They have nowhere to go, and in some cases, the moveset just completely screws over the boss, like in this instance where Fortisax ends up jumping up to the second floor and has trouble getting down. Eventually, she comes back down to get blasted and is dead on only the second attempt. That actually wasn't so bad. Alrighty, up to the branches for the next boss, and... Oh, crap, it's Gideon. Uh, Mimic Tear does come in clutch here, though. His spinning weapon is really good at bullying Gideon, but as much as I try, I have an extremely difficult time landing a rock blast on him while he's being staggered. He just rolls around too dang much, and it certainly doesn't help me that being slow and in melee range is a very dangerous place to be. Mimic gets minced, but not until Gideon's already eaten his flask, so I spend the rest of the fight playing keep away and chucking rocks. It's somewhat safe, but not foolproof, and I have a lot of health to chew through. The glintstone scraps and gravity fans are the only easily renewable rocks that won't be outright dodged, and after those are gone, I make a hard choice of burning my cuckoo glintstones to finish the fight. It sucks to use these up, but they do the job. And thankfully, once Gideon's dead, he's dead, and I won't have to fight him ag Oh god, there's a phase two, isn't there? Why do I keep forgetting about that? Oh. Oh, it's just the fire giant. As good as I've gotten at this fight, it's still pretty scary. The small arena is super nice here, but I used nearly all of my healing flasks against Gideon, so I need to be extremely careful. Luckily, he's pretty easy to poison, and I spend the rest of the fight just fighting him as usual. It's a little scary when we're backed up against a wall and he decides to roll, since I could get really unlucky and have him just flatten me in place. But fortunately, that doesn't happen during this fight. Once he enters his next phase, though, things really get scary. The fire orbs are extremely scary due to the small arena, and I got a little greedy and was forced to use my final flask as he transitioned. Luckily, his weak spot makes my rock blaster hit like a truck, and with enough solid fundamentals and good decision making, and plenty of fear because I really don't want to fight Gideon again, we start chipping away. Deep into the fight, I take another big hit. No flasks left, one more and I'm toast. And he's decided to be as much of a coward as I am and sticks his foot into the wall so I can't hit it. It's a little nerve-wracking, but he rolls away, doesn't hit me luckily, and allows me one more cast and goes down. Both bosses together took just under nine minutes and one attempt. Whew. That's the sixth great rune, too, and that can mean only one thing. We have to go and kill Melania. This fight is extremely tough in normal circumstances, but it's much worse here. Not only is my spell slow and easily punishable, but the arena is ill-suited for the madness of waterfowl. Luckily, we're a lot more prepared than we were last time, and my Mimic's favorite new toy of spinning weapon is super effective against Melania's tiny poise. On top of that, each death is pretty frustrating because this run back sucks which always puts a dampener on grinding difficult bosses like this. As bad as this arena is for my safety, it's also bad for Melania herself. She can get stuck in one of the corners of one of these pillars while my Mimic and I turn her into a fine paste. This fight comes down to a lot of luck in not only how many times she decides to use Waterfowl, but also in how well my Mimic decides to play and how often we can get her stuck for massive damage. I also try to maximize my openings by taking advantage of the Mimic's aggression. Every time I notice Melania is being staggered by a Rock Blaster or a spinning weapon, I move in with my own Rock Blaster to stack on the stagger damage to give her less opportunities to move. This can be pretty risky if she decides to engage her Hyper Armor for a Waterfowl or anything else, but the benefits far outweigh the negatives, so I press on. Eventually, the luck stacks up, and on this attempt, we manage to blast more than half of her health bar down in just a few seconds, and after chasing her down, Phase 2 is on. Phase 2 is a perfect time to pull out the gravity chunks, since her Scarlet Aeonia causes her to stay still for a very long time. These do a pretty hefty chunk of damage and helps us get a head start on the phase. Every attempt before this, the Mimic was long dead before reaching this phase, but this time he's healthy, so I'm feeling confident. In general, it's much easier to find openings in Melania's Phase 2 than in her Phase 1. She's far more aggressive, which means less dodging my rocks, so I just keep pelting her with them while she focuses on my Mimic. I let my Mimic tank as long as possible while I throw stones, and he dies when she's at around 20%. My flask situation is looking pretty good, though. I just have to hope that she forgets about waterfowl Uh-oh. Just, just... just gotta... Uh... Oh. Uh, that could have gone so much worse. After that, I panicked a bit and ran behind the throne to heal up and then get back into the fray. All I need is a few openings and she's toast. Come on, Melania, please be nice. Uh, it looks like she decided to listen. 
One ground stab leads to two rock blasts, and then she decides to dive bomb me for my last gravity stone chunk and a cheeky little large glintstone and cuckoo glintstone combo for the win. No rune, but finally, we can move on to the next boss. Oh, it's the beast clergyman. This fight was a little scary at first because I know he's fast. I know how to create openings though, and <laughs> wow, I don't know why, but this boss has a laughably small health pull. I'm not sure what's going on with that, but each rock blast decimates a solid quarter of his health bar. Surprisingly, Malaketh appears for phase two, and his health pull is similarly tiny. A little beefier, but not by much, and I'm worried about his speed and damage potential, so I spend most of this fight chucking rocks, which does the job nicely. I get him low enough for one last rock blaster, and Malaketh is dead. Surprisingly easy after the hell that Melania put me through. No great rune, but hey, that's the final imbued key, and just behind its portal is our last great room, so it's finally time for the final boss. Well, not quite. I first went back to Placidius Axe's actual arena to see if I could get another sacred tier, but no, it's just Morgoth, and all he drops is a golden seed, which is useless by now since I'm capped on flasks. Oh well, how bad could the final boss really be? The first fight is against Godfrey. Because of my fight against his shade many, many hours ago, I already know how this'll go. He's a bit trickier, but I can poison him easily and do the Godfrey dance at a steady pace for the win. It takes a death to relearn the rhythm, but on the second attempt he goes down and reveals the next and final boss, Elden Moog. I love this. Moog, Lord of Blood, is my favorite boss in Elden Ring, so it's very fun for me that he's the capstone of this adventure. It's also really great that the first fight is easy enough that I don't need to use my Mimic, because I'll definitely need it here. I came into this fight without the purifying tier equipped, and with only one flask left to my name, so I get trashed pretty quick. For most of the attempts, my Mimic lasts about as long as Moog's Phase 1 does. He's also so resistant to poisoning that I couldn't get my rocks to poison him a single time, so I stopped bothering to try and just used as much as I needed against Godfrey. Many deaths later, everything was finally lining up. Just one problem though, I I'm out of blue. This far into the fight and I have no flasks, no FP, and all I can do is sigh as I wait for my inevitable demise. This was the tenth attempt. On the twelfth though, the stars aligned. The mimic lasted much longer, I came equipped with another blue flask, and Moog goes down to one final rock blaster after two hours and ten minutes worth of attempts. So there it is. The story of how a lowly stone digger became the Elden Lord in a land consumed by chaos. I thought a randomizer would add some spice to this challenge, and it did, but I don't think I'll do this style of a randomized challenge run again. I underestimated the hell out of it. The whole run took me a little over 40 hours, which really wasn't that much shorter than the Elden Roll video, <laughs> and I think that's saying something. At the end of my shield only challenge video, I mentioned that this isn't a challenge run channel and I wouldn't be doing anymore, but this is the fourth one I've released now and honestly, it's the only type of content that YouTube deems worthy enough of attention. I mean, look at this, it's ridiculous. So I guess for better or for worse, I'm a challenge run YouTuber now. If you don't like that, I I'm sorry. Blame YouTube for forcing me down this path. But if it sounds fun to you, don't forget to do all the helpful YouTube things like liking the video and subscribing. That said, I have a few ideas in the pipeline that I'm working on, but I would love to hear your challenge run ideas. Not just for Elden Ring either. Any challenge run for any game, preferably something that hasn't really been done yet. I can't promise I'll do them, but hey, sometimes you viewers have better ideas than us creators, and it would be fun to make some of your ideas happen. Big thanks to my super generous patrons, you guys are always awesome, and another big thank you to you for being awesome and watching this whole thing. I'll see you next time.